Hello and welcome to a special edition of Lockdown TV from Unheard. It's been a bit of a strange afternoon here in the UK since, very sadly, Prince Philip, uh, the Queen's husband, passed away soon after midday our time. And ever since then, the news bulletins all stop. Uh, uh, the newsreaders wear black ties and black jackets, and the whole atmosphere of the day has changed. And here, I'm happy to say, to help us make some sense of it, um, is someone who knew Prince Philip well, and whose own family, the Churchills, are another great British family who's been close to the royal family throughout the 20th century. So Winston Churchill's grandson and recently retired Tory MP, Sir Nicholas Soames. Hi, Sir Nicholas. Good afternoon. So what are your thoughts today on uh, Prince Philip's passing? Well, I think it's a, a, a terribly sad day for the country. Um, I think um, Prince Philip was never really given the kind of credit that he was due, in my view. Um, this is a man who, after an extraordinarily distinguished war service, and it was very distinguished, uh, continued in the Royal Navy after the war, married Princess Elizabeth as she was then, and actually gave up um, a glittering naval career. And it was a glittering naval career. He would undoubtedly have gone to the top of the Royal Navy to be the Queen's consort. Um, and that is quite a thing to give up. And I think that he provided for the Queen um, an absolute rock of stability and security, and I think above all confidence, which is mm. what the sort of, you know, that he'd learned from his own life. I mean, he had a very, very difficult childhood indeed. And uh, I think that it worked both ways. That I think she gave him great confidence and, mm. and solidity. So it was a marriage of 73 years and, you know, one must reflect today on top of all the tributes that the Queen has lost her greatly loved husband, who was the beating heart of her family. And it is a, a, a day of, as you say, it's a, it's a strange day and it's a day of reflection. And I hope people will get him right. You know, the, the press, with their attention span with which they are famous, um, always talked about his gaffes. I mean, his gaffes were that he was... Prince Philip was, what you saw was what you got. He was an absolutely ramrod straight former naval officer um, who didn't have much time for uh, sycophancy or bloody fools or anyone else and spoke as he found. But he was essentially a man of great good humour as a person. He had tremendous wit and charm. He was extremely well informed, as indeed you and I would be well informed if we met the kind of people that he was always dealing with. Mm. Uh, and he held very strong views. So, you know, this is not a mere figure. Do you think um, there's something quite strange about the sheer passage of time as well? I mean, 1921, yes. when he was born, I mean, when he became consort was 1947. Yeah. You know, the, Truman was president in America, de Gaulle, Stalin. It was truly another era. What do you think we've lost in terms of a connection to that era? It's, it's a very good point, Freddie. I mean, he outlasted 14 prime ministers, which you know, he'd rarely seen it all. I mean, he, uh, the Queen became Queen when Churchill was prime minister. Um, he has been at the center of events for a very long time. And I'm, you know, one of the saddest things about Prince Philip dying and about a lot of people who die of his generation is that they are the last of a generation that people talk about slightly glibly, but they, they did, they were the last of the wartime generation. Mm. You know, he did see active service. He knew what it was like to command in great difficulty and in hours of great danger. Um, and I think he had a very fair, a, a, a obviously tremendous understanding of European history um, because of his birth and his own circumstances of his life. And of course, looking back at his experience, as you say, over all that period of time, it is a, the telescope of time is a, is a fascinating thing. And, and it, it, it is a very interesting life that he lived. Do you think there are values that his generation had and that he embodied that now feel foreign 
and far away? Um, I don't think they feel foreign, but I think a lot of them feel quite far away. I mean, he wasn't a sentimentalist, Prince Philip, at all. He didn't, he wasn't a sentimentalist. Mm. Um, but he was a tough egg. He was very, very fit. I remember being deeply ashamed um, seeing him uh, as I used to, you know, um, in the countryside. I mean, he he he, he was a, 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 a really fit man. He kept himself mentally and physically in very good order. Mm. Um, and he was interested in so much, you know, I, I, but I think the values that you're talking about are, are the, you know, I think if you served in the war, you served with a different generation of men and women. You just did. They were tougher than so do you we think that's are, it? You think it's the toughness is the, the sort of stiff upper lip, what's called a stiff upper lip. It's that kind of atmosphere yeah. that's now yeah. rarer. He, he was the epitome of the stiff upper lip. I mean that, Freddie, in the best sense of the word. I mean, it wasn't that he didn't share emotion and things in, in any way, but he was a great believer in picking yourself up and getting on with it. And do you think people are less, less like that now? I'll tell you what I think we've lost that his generation had is that we've lost any form of sense of proportion about what goes on. Everything, you know, is, everything is, is bulled up into an enormous drama. Mm. Whereas if you've lived in that generation, you live through a, a, an era of profound upheaval and you learn to distinguish between what was important and what wasn't important. I think we've lost that now. What are your uh, personal memories of him? I mean, your, your grandfather was Prime Minister for the second time when, when Elizabeth uh, became Queen. They, the fam your mother, uh, Mary, who was Winston Churchill's youngest daughter, was helping him at the time. Do you have memories of them as a young child? I, I met him for the first time 60 years ago this year. Wow. Uh, in Scotland. Um, and I was, you know, really, it has been one of the greatest things of my entire life to have known Prince Philip and to have had the opportunity to to talk to him, but more importantly, to listen to him um, and to see him in, at work and at play. And um, I am left with the, um, the indelible impression that something very big has gone from my life, and I think from the life of this country. I, I really do, and I think that he will be, I think you will find that tomorrow, the tributes that are paid to Prince Philip by the national press and everyone else will be very profound indeed um, mm. and they will rightly be profound because he has played a very big part in our national life you know as the as the queen's consort and not just in this country but throughout the commonwealth too where he was greatly respected and the work that he did for instance as an environmentalist uh, uh, the world wildlife fund all these marvelous causes that he espoused Mm. were very relevant in those countries. Um, uh, and I think he's also, you know, in a way, a polymath. I mean, he was a, he was a painter. He was an author. He wrote some very good books. I don't know if you've read a book. He wrote a book called A Question of Balance, which was a series of essays that were published, I think, from lectures that he gave at St. George's House at Windsor, mm. uh, which are absolutely remarkable. Um, and um, that's actually one of the less well-known things about him, isn't it? St George's yes. House at Windsor, for people watching, is a, a religious uh, attachment to the chapel at Windsor Castle meant for people to come and ask exploratory questions and think about the, the bigger questions in life. Do you think he was a, a, a thinker, a kind of serious searching person? I don't think there's any doubt about it. He was certainly a thinker. Um, and, and um, um, you know, he was a thinker. And, 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 um, and he had a a highly, I think, a, a, a theological, not theological bent, but he was interested in the in the sort of spiritual side of life. Do you think that, is that where Charles has got it from, do you think, that more almost mystical attitude? No, I don't think, it, I don't think it's mystical uh, with Prince Philip. I think it's a matter of good, sound common sense. And a lot of what he says in The Question of Balance is absolutely 100% correct from beginning to end. No, I don't think it's mystic at all. I think it's just solid sound experience gained mm. by a long time in public service in peace and war. 
He has this reputation for, you, you mentioned gaffes, but people think of him as someone with quite a sharp sense of humor, cutting through. Was that your experience as well? Was he con yes. con he puncturing did, he the He didn't like bloody fools. He, he didn't like bloody fools. And if he, if he thought you were talking rubbish, he told you. And, you know, I think there's nothing more rewarding than that in life. And I, the other thing that I think particularly about him, Freddie, was that he was, um, he, he, what you saw with Prince Philip was what you got. There was nothing fake about him in any sense. He was completely authentic as a human being. Uh, and mm. and um, I think it must have been a great challenge for him when he first started um, as the Queen's consort, you know, to, to, to not to um, allow his own character to dominate. I mean, he was always in the Queen's wake and he supported her through thick and thin, through some terribly difficult times. And let's look, face it, I mean, the royal family can get stick for whatever they do pretty much, sadly. But the fact is he was a reformer and the, the royal family underwent a series of reforms, you know, engineered by the Queen and Prince Philip, mm. which have all been, in my view, very successful. So I, I think he leaves um, a, remarkable, a remarkable legacy. Most of which is also, you know, let's not beat about the bush. He was a devoted husband, father, grandfather and great grandfather. And he took great, great pleasure uh, in the company of his children. And, and um, I, you know, my heart goes out to them. They, it mm. is a terrible loss for them. We mentioned it was a strange day today. And, you know, all of the BBC presenters change into black ties and black costumes and we get this I've changed into a black tie. Yeah, I see that. But but it's a very different, somewhat more deferential, it almost feels kind of out of time when we get these moments. And I I, I think foreign people watching would be a bit surprised how the the, the sort of national atmosphere changes at moments like this. I, I suppose you also would have experienced it with your own grandfather's funeral, these these sort of momentous historic moments. I just wonder well, what do you think they're I, about? I, I don't think uh, people, foreigners, will think it at all strange. I mean, um, they, many of them have much better manners than, uh, than the English do and would be affronted if they weren't properly. Mm. Member, uh, uh, the, the protocol wasn't properly attended to. But I think it's absolutely right. A member of the royal family dies. I think they are shown a mark of respect and reverence. And as you say, you know, the word deference, which is always used to sort of as a sort of word where no one can think of anything else to say, um, I think people would have wanted in great numbers, in great numbers, to come and show their respects to Prince Philip. And I think it's very sad and entirely correct and understandable that there are going to have to be very special arrangements for the funeral, because after all, the royal family won't want to be behave the same as anyone else will. So you know, it'd be a very small funeral, and I understand his body will lie in state um, or, or will, will rest at Windsor before his burial. Um, uh, and it is not going to be a great do. Mm, because um, of COVID. But I have no doubt at all that I know for a fact Prince Philip did not want a state funeral. But there would have been an opportunity for the public, in my view, to have had the opportunity to pay their respects to him. And, and uh, because I think he was greatly admired actually uh, and I think we're going to find out in the next few days how much admired he was and it's not just um, British sentimentality it is because they feel people feel it it would be right to do so for a lifetime of mm. public and devoted service. A lot of people will now be thinking about the Queen of course who is alone in her um, job and of course, we don't even want to talk about it, but inevitably at some point, and hopefully it doesn't come anytime soon, uh, the Queen herself will pass away. A lot of people will be anxious about that today, don't you think? I think it's a very good point, Freddie, but I think their first reaction will be that they will be very sad for the Queen, very sad for her. And I feel, you know, I just, I think it's, you know, it is a terrible day for her. And she will be now alone. And luckily, she has a very devoted and close family. But, you know, let's, let's jump one fence at a time. I just think it's worth acknowledging that it is a big day for this country, mm. that he was a big figure. 
and he played a big part in our national life and we will mourn his departure. Sir Nicholas Soames, thank you so much. Thank you, Freddie. Thank you to Sir Nicholas Soames, uh, the grandson of Winston Churchill. Uh, Sir Nicholas himself born just one year after the Queen married Prince Philip, uh, whose mother, Mary Churchill, Winston's youngest daughter, was closely involved throughout those early years and who himself got to know the Duke of Edinburgh over a 60 year period, sharing some of his thoughts on what it all means. Thanks to him and thanks for joining. This was Lockdown TV.